I'm Mark, I'm youth minister here at Towering Oaks, and I uh, just want to tell you my story as briefly as I can. I grew up in a small town in South Arkansas, and I went forward at a VBS uh, between my third and fourth grade years of school, and well, I don't remember much. I remember getting in the baptistry. I remember the pastor putting my head under the water. I remember my feet coming up and my toes waving at the congregation. But if you were to see my life in middle and high school, you would wonder uh, if the Holy Spirit was really driving me. And I began to doubt where I stood with God my senior year of school. Uh, And that carried through college. And my senior year of college, I finally uh, realized where I stood uh, before Christ. I was at a revival service with my then girlfriend, now wife, Jamie, and I remember the pastor uh, sharing a story about something that happened to him when he was preaching a revival at another location. And uh, what the turnout of that story just jarred me to my soul. And, and I started to wonder, is everything that I know about Christ in my, in my head only, not in my heart? And I don't remember, frankly, anything that he said after that. I don't remember any other bit of the sermon. I don't remember any other song. All I remember is just waiting to the invitation. And when the music started and started to sing, I went down front. I was bawling like a baby because I knew, I knew I didn't know Christ. I knew my eternity wasn't secured. And that night, God hit me in the head with a holy two by four, as I tell uh, students and others. And I knew I needed that assurance. And so that night, in a blubbering mess, uh, I will admit, I was honest with God and just said, I know a lot about you in my head, but I don't know you in my heart. God, I need that fix, God. God, I want that fix. Forgive me for being a fool. Forgive me for basically being self-deceived. And that night, I know that my life changed. That night, I know life, uh, Christ came into my life. I know He he, uh, secured my eternity because my life changed. I had a desire to tell people about the change in me immediately after that. I shared with as many on my football team in college as I could. I shared with the coaches. I called my family. And through those different things, God has confirmed that through three years of doubt, that moment in October of my senior year of college, or junior year, I'm sorry, I knew that I belonged to Christ. And that's my story. When we think of evangelism, a lot of things come into our minds. Sometimes there's stereotypes, as you saw in the video, of different ways people uh, try to share their faith. Maybe some misconceptions about what evangelism is. So that's what we're talking about this morning. We've been in an emphasis all year about sharing our faith. We are sharing our stories on on video each uh, Sunday morning uh, as an encouragement that you can share your testimony. You can share your story And God will use it of how he has impacted your life, of how he has changed your life. How as a a college football player, I realized that for three years that I was struggling with doubt, that I didn't know Christ. Because everything I knew about him, I knew in my head. There was a lot about my life. There were a lot about things going on that my life didn't show that I had the heart for Christ. And so that night in October 18th, Like I said in the video, I got hit in the head with a holy two by four. And I went down and it wasn't anything about the words. It wasn't about the fact that I was standing over here on the speaker's left, bawling my eyes out. It was about the fact that my heart was broken before a holy God, that I knew that I was separated from him, that I knew that I needed the assurance of heaven through a relationship with Christ. And all it took was a simple invitation. Jamie and I had only been dating a month. A month and a day, actually. She said, hey, you want to go to the revival service with me tonight at at the church I go to? Because I went somewhere different. And that simple sentence, that simple question, that simple invitation changed my life. God had a plan. And he used a pretty beautiful woman to do it, too, so I feel honored. (laughs) 
<laughs> so this morning we're going to talk about evangelism. This past weekend, our students have been learning about the prodigal son, been studying Luke 15, and uh, Brother Tommy and I kind of chuckled at God's timing. At He preached on that last Sunday, and then we've spent a whole weekend talking about it this Sunday. And so we, in essence, are wrapping that up and also kicking off a family porch initiative called Tell the Story. But what I want to do is something very practical this morning, hopefully, and that we just talk about evangelism, talk about some different ways that we can be encouraged and and share our faith. So let's start at the beginning. What is evangelism? Simply it's sharing how God's story and your story got on the same page. You see, I had a story that was running its own race with school and, um, and football and sports going one direction. God has a story that's going a different direction, going towards his glory. And on that Sunday night on October 18, his story met mine. And my story has become a part of his story. If we're being honest, though, evangelism is the aspect of our faith that excites us to most, the most but scares us the greatest. We want to share our faith. We want to tell others about Christ, that we've received the greatest gift in the world. We've received the greatest gift for eternity, the greatest gift humanity has ever been given. But the thought of sharing Christ with someone can sometimes, if we're being ugly honest, causes our palms to sweat and our feet to shiver. And sometimes out of fear, we may not say anything. Because we're afraid of the unknown response. We're afraid of how the other person may respond to us. Or we may be afraid of they ask, they're asking a question and we have to say, I don't know. Which is probably one of the best answers that we can give. And say, I don't know. But you know what? I'm going to find out the answer and I'm going to come back and I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to let you know what the answer is to your question to the best of my ability. And so as we get into the Tell the Story campaign it, that, we, that we're kicking off this morning, I want to share my thought process behind this is, you know, how do we go from zero to gospel conversation? How do we go from just meeting someone to a gospel conversation? Or how do we go from someone we have known our entire life and move to a gospel conversation? I was uh, listening to one of our uh, evangelism uh, trainers and specialists through our state convention. His name's David Evans at a recent conference. And he made a statement that struck with me that I want to give him credit for, if you will. It's not my own. But he says, what we face today is not a lack of evangelistic or baptism efforts, but it's a lack of replication effectiveness. We're great at sharing the gospel. We're great at crusades and revivals and things to to share the gospel with others. But where we fall is the next steps. What happens after we're saved? And I know that's heavy on my heart and and heavy in in how I want to lead our student ministry and partner with parents is taking those next steps. I know that's heavy on the rest of the staff's heart from Dennis's to Jay's to Shelley's to Brother Tommy's is disciples making disciples, mentoring, discipling in small groups, one-on-one, one-on-two, the whole process that through evangelism, we can take a, we, we can see a person come to know Christ and then they're sharing Christ. They're becoming a disciple who disciples somebody else. Vince Lombardi says, inches make champions, inch by inch, step by step. It's not gaining a mile in one day. It's moving forward one step at a time. And what I want to do this morning is help us move forward just an inch further than what we were yesterday. Maybe two inches further than what we were yesterday. This is not an overnight thing. This is not an instant relief. It's not you take a Tums and your heartburn's gone. But it's a slow encouragement. It, 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 it's an encouragement. It's a, it's a process. It's learning. It's growing. It's taking the wins. Learning from where maybe we fall short. So let's start with our mission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This is our mission. Jesus says, it, it, it's, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey or observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. We're called that as we go through life, as we're walking to the water cooler at work, as we're going to Taco Bell for lunch, as we're sitting down at the dinner table at at our house, as we're in the kitchen cooking with, with our kids or with our spouse, 
as we are maybe hosting friends, as we're going, we're making disciples, we're having these conversations because Jesus has promised to be with us. He has promised to be near us, to to give us the words. He has promised that he will always be there. And so as we are going through life, we recognize our arena of service, and that is in Acts 1.8. And this is going to springboard us into Psalm 25, where we're going to spend the rest of the morning. Acts 1.8, Jesus says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit's come on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. When it comes to evangelism, we're great by going to the ends of the earth. We're great by going to Judea. We're great by going into Samaria. We're great with sending missionaries and partnering with missionaries. And I am not knocking those whatsoever. I love missions. I love missionaries. My wife and her family are former IMB missionaries to West Africa. But as easy as it is to go somewhere to encounter people we've never met, one of the hardest things about evangelism is sharing Christ with those who are closest to us when we come home. And I believe that's why Jesus said Jerusalem first, that we start at home. And that it's easier to talk about sharing the gospel with others instead of maybe our closest friends, maybe our family. And maybe the thought of talking with our kid, talking with our grandchildren, maybe even talking with our spouse, I don't know. It creates the, one of the most nervous things to do because these are the people closest to us that quite honestly have seen us at our worst, that have seen us when we've gone off the ledge, that have seen us when maybe we've blown up, that they've seen us when we haven't had the best of days. And so we feel like we don't have uh, an influence or an impact into sharing Christ with them. And I want to encourage you that it doesn't matter about all those things. What matters is that you are honest with your family. You're honest with your closest friends and say, look, I messed up here and I'm sorry. But I am forgiven. Why? Because there is a God who loves me. There is a God that I love that I don't quite get it right all the time. But I can't help out of my love for him tell you what he has done for me in my life. And as I was thinking about this, imagine the impact we would have in our area. If, our, if we went from thinking about, you know, we've got maybe one individual in our family, whoever that is, that is great at sharing their faith with others. What would be the impact if all four members of that same family? What would be the impact if all six members of my family were uh, sharing the gospel consistently? But then the thought of trying to lead our family into doing that, I didn't grow up that way. My parents divorced when I was a child. Going to church was never discouraged. We, my mom took me when I asked to go. And if I didn't ask to go, nothing was said. And so I look at these questions and I look at this aspect of tell the story. And I look at my four children and I'm going, I wasn't raised this way. And I've read a lot. I've studied a lot. I have a passion. Of, but how do I do it? Because I don't want to get it wrong. I don't want to lead my children in the wrong direction. I don't want to lead my wife in the wrong direction. And so we can be paralyzed by fear because we're not sure of what to do. But we do have the command out of Deuteronomy 6 that while we sit, while we walk, while we lie down, while we rise up, we impart God's word to our children, to our families. We talk about him. We share him. We we talk about how his word applies to our lives day in and day out. And out of that passage, we find that we are to take moments in each day to impart, to teach, to show the character of God to our children, to our family, to encourage them to seek him, to encourage them to come to know him if they don't know Christ. Because it's just as important to teach our children how to see God act in their life and in the world as much as it is about God. We have to teach them good theology, good Bible study skills, but we also have to teach them how to apply it. We also have to teach and encourage and show them how God is working in our lives and how, how we can be honest with our children and say, I'm not quite sure what God's doing right now at work, but I'm going to find a way. Or they have an issue with a classmate and say, well, what does Scripture say about how to handle this situation? Well, why don't you go find out? I'll find out. Let's compare notes. 
Let's see what God's doing. Let's pray for this friend. Let's pray for this teacher. How can you show Christ? How can you be Christ to your classmates? And so my desire is that families are not just families of faith, but we are families who talk about our faith. And that's where these packets come in. If I've estimated correctly, each family will be able to get one of these packets on your way out. We'll have ushers at the doors with these packets called Tell the Story. And I want to show you and tell you a little bit about what's in them to help encourage you in having gospel-centered faith conversations with your family. There are two little business cards. These are called impact cards where you are to, you can write down the names of three friends on each card to pray for opportunities to share the gospel. You write down three friends, three family members, three co-workers, three people, maybe the cashier at Dollar General, maybe it's uh, a waiter at Monterey's, whatever it is, you put it down and you pray for them to have an opportunity to come to know Christ and you pray for the opportunity to share Christ with them. There's two of these in each packet. There's just a general letter that kind of explains it. This is what's called a family interview. It's an activity for family members to discover one another's faith stories. If you've never shared your faith story with your children, this is a great way to do it. If you don't know the faith story of your spouse, this is a great way to do it. And it walks you step by step on how to do that. Here's another activity called Upstairs Downstairs. Another way to encourage your family. Uh, you know, if, if your kids are grown and gone and you're home and you're in the phase of life stage of being a grandparent, grab a packet and, and see if you can do something with your grandchildren. If not, give the packet to, to, your, to your own children and say, this is for you and this is what it is. And you can show them how to have a faith conversation with their family. There's a good news family activity, a couple's date night. Guys, it's step by step. I, I heard that applause. Here's a card, helps you write out your story. If you've never thought about how to share your testimony, this will help you write it out. For, for the kids, here's a track that the kids can use to share the gospel with their friends. And it just opens right up, front and back. Another neat resource that will debut on our Facebook page uh, about 12.30 this afternoon, give or take a few minutes, is going to be an animated video that explains this that you can send as a private message to friends and family. You could share on your page. But this resource is free to you and also will be on our Facebook page. And then here's another guide about creating opportunities at home to talk with your family, to talk with your loved ones, your your closest friends, to help with uh, encouraging being able to write your testimony. If you're a part of our uh, family Facebook group, There's a video that will uh, come on about the same time, about 1230, give or take, that will talk about how to create a two-minute testimony. So a lot of resources to help you have these conversations with your family and encourage the family to have these conversations with your friends, coworkers. So turn with me to Psalm 25 as we continue to break this down and talk about what evangelism looks like. Now, if you're in the realm of education, you would understand levels of learning. You would understand what uh, the terms of understanding and comprehension and uh, analysis and synthesis, levels of learning. You understand all of that. And it's amazing that even before we kind of figured that out, God has that same process sitting right in the middle of Psalm 25. So those of you that, that, that are teachers that understand what I'm talking about, I know you're salivating right now that this is going to be cool. All right, Psalm 25. We're going to read verses 4 and 5, and then I'm going to back up and we're going to break it down. Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. I wait for you all day long. Pray with me, please. Father, we thank you for this morning. And Father, as we jump in to talk about sharing our story as it intersects with your story. And Father, as you change our life, I pray for clarity. I pray that I'm able to communicate clearly the things you want me to say. Father, I pray for the hearts of everybody here, including my own, that we hear your spirit. That whether if it's conviction, challenge, or call, we answer it. 
And we come before you with an open heart and empty hands saying, God, mold me and use me. God, guide our time in these moments. We love you. Amen. So we look at the first part of verse 4. The CSB and the ESB say, make your ways known to me. New King James says, show me your ways. And as I was looking and studying, it it shows to me that this, uh, number one, the psalm is, is a declaration of complete dependence on God. The writer is depending on God for everything. And so in the middle of this prayer, he goes through this, give me this desire, make me know your ways, show me your ways. I want to know the tools that it takes. I want to know the tools that I need to use to further my relationship with you and also to tell others about your glory, to tell others about the peace found in you, to tell others about the purpose that I find in you. The desire to know God means we are in his presence. We've come into his presence and we have a desire to know him. Show me your ways, God. Make me, make your ways known to me. So when we're sharing and talking about our faith, that means we need to be present. If we're present with God, that means when we are present with the people that we're talking to. I'm not just talking about physically present. We can be present with God and never hear anything. We can be standing in his presence. We can be worshiping and maybe not hear his voice, not hear the call. Unless our heart is present with us. Unless our mind is present with us. That means when we're talking with our family. That means when we're sharing with our friends. That means when we're bringing God up with our co-workers. We are mentally, spiritually, and emotionally present. As well as physically present. Because we, want to, we desire to be in God's presence. To hear from Him. To change us from, from our mind and our heart into our actions. So that if we're, when we're communicating God's story to others. When we're communicating our testimony. When we're communicating scripture. We want to be physically, emotionally, and spiritually present with others. To hear where they're at. To hear the hurts. To hear the questions. To hear where, who they are. And be able to not just give a presentation, but we have a conversation. Something that just happens because we are listening. We're asking questions. And as we are being shown the ways, as we're asking God, make your ways known to me. We're also asking him to teach me his past. Teach me his ways. And as we're teaching our children... We need to create, and this goes not just for our children and our family, but it also goes for our children and our Sunday school and our small groups. It goes for our adult groups. We've got to create a safe place for conversations to happen. Our children and our family, our family members, our small group members, our Sunday school class need to feel safe in asking questions. They need to feel safe that they're not going to be made fun of, that they're not going to be looked at weird for asking a question that we think is basic. But a safe atmosphere needs to be created because if they don't feel safe asking us questions, they're going to find the answers from someone else, somewhere else that may very well go against the word of God. And if we're not creating a safe atmosphere within our family to allow for questions and doubts and exploration, if we're not creating a safe atmosphere for people to ask questions about life and scripture in our small groups, in our Sunday school classes, they're going to find the answers elsewhere. As helpful as Google is, Google's also a very scary place to find answers. When we feel the safest in God's presence, we hear his voice clearer. Recently, my wife and I had a conversation with someone who has emotional trouble thinking of God as father. When worship songs talked about God's love as a father towards us, as him as our heavenly father, this individual struggled greatly with that concept because of the experience they had with their father growing up. And so worship then became a place they did not feel safe in because the the thought of God as father brought up so many emotions from their past that suddenly they felt nervous. And so are we asking God daily, 
how can I create a safe place for people to worship, for my family to ask questions, for my children, no matter how old they are, do they feel safe enough to ask me the tough questions, to ask me, God, Dad, I am doubting this about God. Where do I do? What do I do? Do they feel safe enough to ask that? You know what? It may blow you away the questions they ask, and I may look at my own kids and go, I don't have a clue. But I am going to say, I am going to pray over it, and I'm going to find an answer. Why don't you go look in Scripture as well, and in two days, we'll come back and we'll talk about it. Let's see what we've found. Let's see what God has shown us. Let's dig into the Scripture. We have to create safe places to ask questions. Now, once we show them the tools... Once we show them, hey, this is what a testimony looks like. This is how you talk about what God is doing in your life. We show them and we teach them how to use it. Let's put them in their hands. And let's say, okay, why don't you pray for someone to to start a conversation with this week? And you know what? We all have certain tools that we feel comfortable with versus others. God has wired us all uniquely. God has wired us all in special ways that certain types of sharing the gospel come more natural than others. When I look in scripture, there's some different personalities, some different ways people have invited others to come to know Christ. So that means as you grow in knowledge, as you grow in your relationship with God and he reveals to you who you are in him and how he's wired you, you're going to find the right tool to share your faith that is going to fit your personality. There's some that are great at the invitational sharing. I think of Andrew who looked at Peter and said, Peter, come with me and come meet the Christ. I have seen him. Many are great at, hey, why don't you come to church? We've got these um, cards out in the foyer that you can get and that has our address on it. And in conversation with someone, hey, we'd love for you to come worship if you don't have a place. And here's a card that has information. Invitational, they excel at that. We may be nervous at talking to the cashier in the gas station and just, hey, why don't you come to church with us? That may, you know, you you may not be comfortable with that. That's okay because there's also the testimonial way. Think of the blind man looking at the religious leaders. I really don't know what you're saying, but you know what? I met Christ. I was blind, but now I can see. I know who Jesus is. We can share our testimony about what God is doing in us and through us. That it's natural to tell about how we came to know Christ and it's natural for us to tell what Christ is doing in our lives right now. Some of us excel at the testimonial sharing. Others, it's through being a servant, showing compassion. Acts tells of Lydia who was saved and basically wouldn't take no for an answer and just said, Paul, you and your crew, come stay with me and let me serve you. Some Some excel at hospitality. Some excel at just showing and giving. And you share the gospel that way. Others of you, you love a little debate. You love apologetics. You love the intellectual battles. That's Paul at Areopagus. See, God has designed us uniquely and given us strengths on how to share the gospel that once we find the right tool, it's just natural. Once we find the way that fits our personality, it just flows. We know our style of sharing, whether it's through our testimony. We memorize the Romans Road, the faith outline. We're comfortable with the ABCs that we teach the children at VBS. Maybe you know multiple tools. As I shared earlier about Jamie's simple invitation for me to go to church with her that Sunday night, sometimes evangelism is said more in a sentence than it is in a paragraph. Sometimes sharing God's love is said more in just, I'm so sorry that you lost your dad. You know what? I don't know how I would have made it through that pain without my Savior. And then you just wait and see what the response is. There's an invitation for someone to respond. What do you mean the love of a Savior? What do you mean you couldn't make it through the death of a parent without the love of God in your life? Through one sentence, you can open up a whole door. Sometimes evangelism is more of a sentence than it is a paragraph. So let's move on to the first part of verse 5. Guide me in your truth. And teach me, lead me in your truth. Day by day, God is leading us. Day by day, he is guiding us through everyday encounters. 
I'm going to give you, uh, and I got this from David Evans, and I'm going to let you blame me for this. Some of you are trembling right now, and that's okay, but you can use me. Throw me under the bus. Gospel appointments. You have a friend, a family member, a coworker, someone you want to share the gospel with. Here's what you do, and you can use me. Let's just say their name is Joe. Hey, Joe, this is Mark. Hey, I have an assignment for my youth pastor. I'm supposed to share my story with one person. Hey, you want to run to Catalyst and grab a cup of coffee with me and let me practice sharing my story so I can tell Mark how it went? Okay, I'll see you tomorrow at 11. And you go and you have coffee and it's just a natural part of the conversation because you know what? If you never get to it, guess what your friend's going to do? Hey, Joe, you wanted me here because you wanted to practice sharing your story because your youth pastor gave you the assignment to, well, what's your story? There you go. A gospel appointment. Use me. Throw my name under the bus. That's fine. If it involves you bringing up the gospel to a friend, tell them I said you had to do it. Tell them I'm going to increase your tithe by 2%. No, I'm kidding. Don't. (laughs) Don't. But what happens? It lowers the anxiety because you already have a purpose. You're already going to be there. The other person already knows what's coming, even though they may not understand the phrase, share the story. They're going to say, what is this? What do you mean share your story? What does that mean? Here's the conversation. And at the end of it, make sure you say, hey, does that, does that make sense to you? Would you like to trust Christ like I did? There's your gospel conversation through a gospel appointment. Maybe it's through servant evangelism. Maybe it's through creating ways to talk about God to others. Handing out water, uh, serving at a clothes closet or a food bank. But I do want to be clear on this. A lot of us uh, confuse, and it it, it shattered my world when when I was told this. The difference between ministry and missions. We do a lot of ministry when we're helping people. We're, we're sorting clothes, we're mowing yards, we're repairing houses, we're doing all sorts of things, we're doing ministry. Where it becomes missions is when we share Christ. So if we're helping someone, if we're fixing a light fixture, if we're mowing a yard, if we're serving food, we're doing ministry. Find a way to bring up the gospel. Find a way to bring Jesus into the conversation and you've just created a missions moment. You've just created servant evangelism. You're handing them a cup of cold water and telling them about the water of life at the same time. Because you're now, you've now seen the tools. You've been taught the tools. Now you're using them. Now you're making it your own. You're finding finding how God has wired you to naturally share the gospel. And then the last of verse 5, I'll wait for you all day long. We're back in God's presence. We're seeing these opportunities open up. We're seeing God move. We're having these opportunities to share our faith. And so we are coming and continually being in God's presence. We're launching our children forward into adulthood. We're, we've mentored someone and discipled someone for 12 to 18 months. And now we're saying, hey, go fly on your own. Find someone else to do with them what we have done for the last 12 to 18 months. Because when we get to the point of saying, God, I'm waiting for the next appointment. I'm waiting for the next opportunity. We're realizing the urgency in sharing the gospel. We're realizing the broken lives that are out there. We're realizing that it's not that hard. But it also brings an awareness to our personal holiness. That as we've grown through the journey... We realize that evangelism is not as much as a routine as it is God bringing us encounters on how he's wired us. It's about our awareness of how far we fall short. It's not thinking of ourselves more highly than we should, but it's the posture of the evangelist is the posture of repentance that we're daily coming before God as the tax collector. In Luke 18, God, forgive me. Forgive me. I'm humbled. I am honored to be able to be used by you, but I fall so short. Why do you continually do this? Forgive me, God. I want to love you more each day. Forgive me for for saying the wrong thing or acting the wrong way. Personal repentance day after day. When we repent, we are reminded of our need for a Savior, which reminds us of their need for 
a Savior. And understanding that repentance is a complete 180. Going from an enemy of God to a child of God. Going from a life about me to a life about Him. A life of rebellion against God to a life that wants to do nothing but worship and serve and share, others, share with others about who Christ is. And so just through a few simple things, I think we can take an inch forward today. But it all begins before we can take that step. The starting line is a relationship with Christ. You see, a little more to my story is I went forward at VBS, as I said. But by the time I was, was saved in college, there was another time in between I didn't have time to get into where I did walk the aisle a second time and ended up in the baptistry a second time. But that was more out of a personal guilt instead of a godly conviction. I understand what it means to walk with doubt. I understand what it means to be in constant conflict within myself of, I know a lot about you, God, but do I really know you? And it was on that Sunday night that I felt broken before God. My heart was torn open and I realized I needed a Savior. I never want to cause doubt by, by anyone. I never want them to question where they stand before God. But what I can say is, is I know if, if you're there, I know what it feels like. But I also know what it feels like when the Spirit comes crashing in, wrecks your life, and cleans you up all in the same motion. That in Romans 5... Verse 10 says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. It was in that moment on that day that I realized that even though I knew about God, my life was proving I was an enemy of his. And I needed peace. And that peace comes from faith in Christ. Peace comes from a relationship of bringing it all and just pouring it all right before him, being on my hands and knees, beating my chest, God, forgive me. Because nine verses earlier in verse one of chapter five of Romans says, when we have our place, our faith in Christ, we have peace with him. Do I always get it right? No. I probably get it wrong more than I get it right. I don't even know all the questions to assume I have all the answers. But the one thing I do know, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I do know once I was in rebellion with God, now I have peace with God. And that is because I had that moment when I came before a holy God, understanding how broken I was and that I could do nothing to resolve that, that Christ has already done everything. The gospel is when my story was encountered with God's story and his story wrecked my life but healed me all at the same time. And his story is so much better than the road I was on. His story is so much better than the story I was trying to write. Because my story was full of typos and misspells. If you've ever gotten an email from me, you know what I'm talking about. His story says it is finished. His story is, Mark, you are mine. You're not going to slip through my fingers. You can trust me. And that same peace that I felt on that night and the same peace that God reminds me of when those thoughts and those things start coming into my head about, okay, Mark, was that really the case? God points me back to those stones of faith in my life where I know he has moved to know there's no other way I would have heard God's voice if I wasn't in a relationship with him. There's no other way for me to know what God is doing if I don't have a relationship with him. And so that is the same God that you hear about today, that here in just a moment, as the band wants to go ahead and make their way up, we're going to have a time of decision. And what that time of decision entails is a time for you to do business with God, either right where you stand or this altar is going to be open for prayer. It'll be open to pray for someone you need to share the gospel with. It'll be prayer for something God is dealing with your life about. If you have questions about what it means to know Christ, about what it means to have a relationship with him, I'm going to be down front. Brother Dennis is going to be up here. 
Brother Jay's in the back. If you don't want to walk all the way down front, I'm sure you could tap him on the shoulder. He would love to talk with you. We will answer your questions. We will never embarrass anyone. This is a time where you can do business with God. And if he's calling you to join this church, take the next step in baptism, whatever it is, this is an opportunity for you to take that step. So as we stand, let us pray.